Oh, bonnie in the sunlight lies that village far away, and gently through the budding trees the wrestling breezes play. The sweet fresh air, say warm and mild, new health and pleasure bring, and the playing bairns laugh in the street at the coming of the spring. Welcome to series two of Stories of Scotland. So that was a beautiful verse from Agnes Mansi about the village of Thornhill to introduce a slightly different angle of Scottish history. Yes, so welcome to Stories of Scotland. I am Jenny, a lowland cartographer. And I'm Annie, a highland historian. So we were interested in Thornhill, which is down in the borders of Scotland, because that's where my grandfather, my papa as I call him, grew up. Jenny and I visited my grandparents and had a blather with them about growing up in rural Scotland during the Second World War and coming of age in post-war Scotland. So this series is a short but very intimate examination of personal and family histories and it was a very touching experience for me. So throughout this series we meander through the childhoods of my grandparents and then um, their working lives in a smiddy and their illicit deeds. (laughs) (laughs) Ooh, keep listening. (laughs) Episode five, gonna have to wait. (laughs) (laughs) Yes, we did. And it was so fun chatting to them. We set up all our podcasting gizmos, as your grandma called them, and recorded these octogenarians talk about their lives in their living room in a wee farm near Nairn in the Scottish Highlands. Is gizmo not a gremlin? I mean... Are we not just little gremlins, <laughs> Annie, at the end of the day? Damn millennials coming in here with all their gizmos. So Granny and Papa gave us tea and empire biscuits. Oh, which were great empire biscuits, by the way. Um, but also, interestingly, despite being a traditionally Scottish snack, before World War One, empire biscuits were actually called German biscuits. But this was changed to be more British during the war. I did not know that. Yeah, and also the same with Belgian buns. Uh, They were originally German buns, but after Germany invaded Belgium, we decided to fight back uh, by with the Battle of the Buns, and we changed the name (laughs) to the Belgian buns. And let me tell you, we won that one. Buns out. Suns out, buns out. I don't know. I I love I love German cinnamon buns. Anyway. (laughs) (laughs) We were interested in my grandparents' stories for a few reasons. So firstly, I'm very conscious that when anyone is looking at history, we're never going to be objective. We all carry with us our life experiences and everything that makes us us. And these kind of act as a filter or lens when we're looking at the past. So my grandparents were the first people to tell me stories of the old days. And I guess my first real encounter with history. Mm. I wanted to go over their early years with them to see what traits I had inherited from them and what perspectives my granny and papa had given me on the world. And I do think that their worldview is quite original and unique because it's a rural voice of people who have lived rural lives at a time when there was a mass shift in technology that was used for agriculture, which absolutely transformed the world. Yeah, definitely. And although they've lived in the Highlands for over 40 years, neither grew up in the Highlands. So your granddad is from the Scottish borders, where a lot of my ancestry is from as well, actually. And your granny is from Ayr, which is on the west coast of Scotland, about an hour west of Glasgow. Yes. So let's begin by meeting my papa. Uh, I recommend this episode with a cup of tea and a delicious empire biscuit. German biscuit. (laughs) (laughs) We'll let Jimmy introduce himself and then we'll pop back in for a blather. So, can you just introduce yourself? Oh, you already know me. (laughs) (laughs) Um, If you introduce yourself for the people listening. Oh, Hello, folks. This is Jimmy Hardy. I'm Anne's grandfather. Is that enough? Yes. Brilliant. Perfect. And what year were you born? 1935. And how old are you? Me, I'm 40, you know, 84. <laughs> <laughs> I just get half it. <laughs> <laughs> and can you tell me about your family? My family? Well, I had 
two brothers and five sisters. And that's about it. <laughs> Him and jo George and me, we were. He, he was my next. He was a couple of years younger than me, but him and me were quite close together. If he saw him, he saw me, you know? Aye. And I mean, yes, Andy, he was about six years younger than me, and he was that much younger that George and me wanted to go off, away or sail, you know? <laughs> and we'd go out the house, and I'd say to George, come on, we'll run away for you, Andy. <laughs> but before we got very far, my mother was out the house, she said, come on, you boys, wait in this, yen. <laughs> <laughs> so we'd turn back and go and get Andy. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, can you tell me about your school days? Did you like school? No, really, but uh, I liked the sports. <laughs> and that was a bit. What did you play? Pardon? What, what sports did you play? Well, the last year I was at the school, I won the cup for the sports. You know, that's the 100 years, the 220 and the relay race and the hurdles, you know? Yeah. I won all them. I, I come in third with a high jump because there was boys jumping about three or four inches higher as me. <laughs> <laughs> but they were big, tall, skinny boys, you know. <laughs> but I beat them in everything else. Uh -huh. But I got the cup for that, for that, the last year I was there. When did you decide that you wanted to leave school? When? I think it was just about when I started. <laughs> <laughs> But I left at 15, like you get, not so early, so you could leave then. And then I started serving my time as a blacksmith. What was technology like when you were a child? Did you have any technology in your no. home? No, I, never, I didn't have technology at the school. I didn't. Have, is that a thing they do at school? New technology. I, did, you, did you have a phone at home? Did you have a wireless? No, no. oh, well, there, there was a wireless, but there was no television then. But I never really listened. I wasn't interested in listening. Listening. I was never in the house hardly. Can you, can you tell me about the type of food that you had in your fridge when you were? Ch oh, did you have a fridge? No. <laughs> <laughs> what kind of food did you eat when you were a child? Oh, just mother did a lot of ham and bacon, you know, and that was it. Everything was baked. <laughs> what did you have for breakfast? Oh, we had a porridge. Oh. Mm -hmm. Do you still have your porridge for breakfast? Oh. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What do you have with your porridge? Just milk. That's all you have with porridge, isn't it? Do you never put salt on it? No, it's, you mix the salt in when you're making it. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Good. Oh, <laughs> can't have unsalted porridge. <laughs> um, and do you remember rationing? Right. Oh, well, vaguely. Oh, I... You got thrums, that was three old pennies. On a Saturday to go in and buy a bar of chocolate because your ration for the sweet ration, that's all it allowed you, one bar of chocolate a week. Mm -hmm. So that was just after the war, of course. Yeah. So Aye. we went down with we a thrupney bit and what we call the square thrupney. <laughs> <laughs> you wouldn't have seen them now. They're can you, the same shape as a 50 pence piece. Mm -hmm. Aye. But it was just made of copper, you know. Mm -hmm. The, the thrupney bit. But that was three pence in old money. But I don't know what that is nowadays. It's not very much, eh? And did you go walking a lot oh, when you were child? Oh, used to walk for miles. What was your favourite place to walk to? Well, for Thornhill, me and my brother George, we used to walk for Thornhill to what called Morton Mains Castle. It was belonged to Robert the Bruce at the end time. Aye. And that's about, I would say, roughly about four or five miles out of Thornhill. Mm -hmm. We used to walk there on a Sunday. And then after that, we walked what they called up the, the Black Hill. And it was a big high hill. And there was a lock on the top of it, you know. We used to go up to the lock and maybe collect seagull eggs and then we'd walk him for there. And that was, it must have been about, I'm not sure, I'm not kidding you, it must have been, all together it must have been about 15 mile. Mm -hmm. you know? Wow. What did you do with the seagull eggs? Oh, well, we just took them him and gave it your mother and she used them for bacon. So she made cakes with? Oh, well, scones, anything at all. Used to make scrambled eggs too and dip the bread in them and fry them. Oh. But all the eggs were, she was keen to get eggs, you know, because uh -huh. the, the, in the days, again, just after the war, there wasn't a lot of eggs, they weren't very plentiful. Mm -hmm. 
mm-hmm. and they were glad to get these eggs. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Only like whop eggs, or peeweeps, or as I say, the seagull, the, any kind of eggs they would eat, eat but no, no, the, no, the wee tiny birds like. Seagull eggs. I don't know about that one. I was doing some research on them and I've read that they were like chicken eggs, but just more salty. So I don't know. It kind of gives me the heebies. But I guess the main cause of this would have been food rationing. So actually, if your eggs are already salted, you're saving on salt. So you don't need to ration your salt as much. Science. Um, <laughs> That's not how it works. <laughs> not how it Look, works every all. little to get you through the war years. Okay, you got to think positive. Um, but yeah, so rationing started in the United Kingdom in 1940, I think, and it ended, was it at the end of the war? Mm, no, so rationing actually continued well after the war, uh, with the final restrictions on some of the meats, I think, I think bacon, not being lifted until 1954. Oh, wow, okay. When I, I read an article somewhere that was, um talking about the celebration of housewives that they could now have as much bacon as they could afford. I am still celebrating that to this day. <laughs> <laughs> um, but even so, I hadn't heard of eating gulls' eggs until my grandfather spoke of it. So I looked it up in some old newspapers. So in 1947, the food minister agreed with the Board of Trade to import gull eggs to the UK from Holland, Denmark and Ireland. Oh, how exotic. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that was bad. <laughs> um, I also found this article from the Dumfries and Galloway Standard from 1941, local to my granddad, mm. where we're given tips for some replacements we can find outside for rationed foods. Um, Jenny, could you be an enthusiastic wartime forager? Rose hips and brambles. In times of scarcity, it is but natural and right that we should search the countryside to see what nature can provide in the way of substitutes for the many products which in normal times we obtain from overseas. We should be thankful that we are not yet in the same desperate state as some of the peoples of many parts of Europe, who, to mention only two examples, are using an acorn brew as a substitute for coffee and supplementing their meagre rations of meat by killing and eating the squirrels and other small mammals of the countryside. This autumn we are being urged to make most of the wild fruits of the hedgerows, the rose hips, those storehouses of the precious vitamin C, and the brambles, which fortunately are both plentiful and the berries of fine quantity and size. Although this searching the countryside for substitutes, bog moss, dressings, herbs for drugs, gull eggs for baking, acorns, beech mast and chestnuts for cattle food is an activity which one would expect to increase and spread in wartime. One possibility, I must confess, had escaped me until a reader called this week to ask where he could find the leaves of the colt's foot to dry for mixing with his pipe tobacco. I was able to tell him where to find a good supply and, from my description of the leaves and flowers, he recognised coltsfoot as a plant known locally as shalaga, and one which it seems has been used often in days gone by to eke out supplies of precious tobacco. The shape of the leaves reminds me of the mark which a colt's hoof would make in the mud of a field or roadside, and this no doubt accounts for the name. Thanks, Jenny. No problem. What I find funny about this, now I really love horses and a colt is a young male horse, but I'm not sure if I could recognise a colt hoof shaped leaf as opposed to any other type of horse hoof shaped leaf. And let me tell you, there are dozens, (laughs) dozens of horse hoof shaped leaves in the British countryside. Only one of which can be smoked with tobacco. (laughs) (laughs) Um, maybe, maybe we won't go foraging for that then. I'll try smoking anything. <laughs> my my grandparents really disapprove of smoking, Jenny. So I'm going to cut that. Okay, that's fair enough. <laughs> um, I also found quite a whimsical story from 1948 of an incredibly unexpected egg collector from Aberdeenshire. Jenny, can you be an 
I need you to be exceptionally proud of this egg collector. All right. Because they are possibly the greatest egg collector of all time. Capital letters. All right. <clears throat> Dog collects gull eggs. <laughs> <laughs> I love this. I love this. Alexander Rennie, Bullers of Buchan, Aberdeenshire, has a dog which makes the dangerous job of collecting gull eggs look easy. It descends steep cliffs, searches crannies, and returns with the eggs one by one in its mouth. Last year, last year, the dog collected 24 dozen eggs. That is 288 eggs with its mouth. What a good boy. Such a good boy. <laughs> I'd be a stick for one of your dogs and it just looked at me. My dog. This dog, this dog is going out to get eggs and your dog can't even fetch a stick. <laughs> God, <I'll hold> <laughs> um. However, not everyone was a fan of gull eggs. The Dundee Courier reported in 1948 that... The public will not be gulled. What an expose. Grocers and cafe proprietors have discovered something the food ministry does not know. It is that you cannot gull the public into eating something that they do not like. When thousands of gull eggs arrived in the shops and cafes, there was a rush for them. They looked attractive and there are people who are willing to try anything once. The result, however, is that basketfuls still remain in the windies. The housewives complain of a fishy taste, and prices, which began at 25 shillings a dozen, are now down to just three shillings. Well, I kind of disagree with this, because it sounds like my papa quite appreciated the gull eggs. They were baked know? into a cake. Yeah, um, mm. I'll eat anything if it's in a cake. This is very true. However, nowadays it's illegal in Scotland to take gull mm. eggs or disturb the nests of any wild birds. So we'll have to leave our fishy, feathery friends alone and we'll go back to my papa. And um, did you grow up in the countryside or in a town? In the village. But the the village, we were the last house in the village, so you were just put your house into a field like you can. Aye. And then away into the wood. <laughs> Did you like the woods? Oh, I used to have, I put swings up in the trees and, and again, you thought your tar ran. <laughs> <laughs> we used to climb up this wee tree to get a, to, to get the rope high enough up, climb up the wee tree, get a hold of the rope and swing it. And then somebody else would climb up the tree the time you were swinging. And jump onto the rope when you came towards him again. <laughs> <laughs> it was good fun, though. Did you know the different names of the trees? Oh, first, oh, the first, again, all the first trees in the beach and oak and oh, sure, I can't all the names of the trees. I mean, that was just born any, was not it? You can't know the names of the trees, too, do you? Yes. No, you can't. It just comes natural, doesn't it? A lot of children nowadays don't know the names of the yeah. trees. Mm. Not anymore. Not it's anymore. sad. Well, we must have learnt it for somebody. For the <laughs> what I love about this bit is how your granddad is so like matter of fact about how he talks mm -hmm. about learning about nature, as if, of course, I learnt all the names of trees. Um, it was just kind of showed how ingrained it was in them from such a young age. It was like a second language for him. It was like asking him how he learned to speak. Of course he doesn't remember. It was this natural development and knowledge that grew as he did. And I feel like that's how he spoke about knowing the names of the trees. Yes, um, I think that for children raised close to the land, this understanding of nature comes on maybe a deeper level. And it was not only encouraged and taught in school, but expected. Mm. And this learning comes outside of the classroom because nature is such a sensory experience. The rustle of leaves, the, the s different smells depending mm -hmm. on the weather that you get. And in rural schools back then, this seems to have really been understood. Yeah, I mean, I studied this um, and I spent ages learning from textbooks in the classrooms, but it wasn't until I was a lot older and started actively exploring nature that I realised there was still so much I didn't understand and also so much that I wanted to. 
But even still, it's it's like learning a language as an adult. It's much harder than being raised bilingual from birth. Yes, but I do think there's um, movements nowadays to get kids from urban places mm-hmm. into the countryside, yeah. which is brilliant. And for people living in rural communities, I think more and more nowadays they're trying to get classrooms to go outdoors mm-hmm. again, um, like they did in the 1940s. And this understanding brings respect for the land and nature, which I feel is very integral to finding our sense of belonging in the environment and the places that we live. Mm-hmm. Um, so Jenny, what tree, for example, would you feel the closest connection to in Scotland? Ah, uh, Probably I'm going to go with the juniper. Um, and funnily enough, it's not because it's like a beautiful, strong and majestic tree. Uh, it's actually a pretty stubbly little shrub-like one, but it's because my mum calls me Jennifer Juniper sometimes and it always makes me smile. From now on, I'm calling you Jennifer Juniper too. <laughs> Just just to make you cringe a wee bit. But I'm certain you are her darling stubby little shrub. So that's quite adorable. Yep, and I'm very prickly too. So there's that. But uh, jun- <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> junipers are one of only three native conifers in Scotland, uh, with the other two being Scots pine and yew. The tree has this gnarly hardcore look about it. The trunks are sinewed and twisted and the needles dense and sharp. Its looks seem to embody the everyday battles the tree must win in order to survive in the quickly shrinking habitats and harsh Scottish conditions. Wow. You make it sound like a warrior tree. All trees are warriors, Anne. (laughs) And juniper berries are also used for flavouring gin, the warrior's drink, (laughs) with the word gin being derived from the word juniper. Ah, amazing. See, that fits perfectly with my mother, as she is a gin fanatic. But you said warrior's drink. Um, why? Uh, because your mum's a warrior too. Oh, uh, she had to be to raise me. <laughs> <laughs> um, no. So, fun fact about gin. In the Eighty Years' War, the English and the Scots were fighting alongside the Dutch allies. Um, and they'd see that the Dutch, before going into battle seemed like they were completely psyched up and full of courage and strength and bravery and um, possibly a a, a little bit um, um, wobbly. Hammered. (laughs) (laughs) Um, Fearless. Fearless. And they were winning. They were fighting hard and winning because they they just had this gun-ho approach. And they asked the Dutch what they were doing right and noticed that they were drinking... Genevieve, which is spirit very similar to gin, which calmed their nerves before battle, and it was so effective that it became known as Dutch courage by the English, and they tried to make the same alcohol for their own troops, sometimes actually paying their troops with a wee bit of gin, mm. and so gin was born. Ah, interesting. Genevieve is strikingly similar to Jennifer, so maybe there is something to this whole gin, Jennifer, Genevieve triangle that my mother is not telling me. But uh, apart from being my own alcoholic namesake, uh, junipers are mainly used for their wood. Not because it's strong or flexible, but because when burnt, it produces a wonderfully aromatic smoke. This smoke was used in rituals and spiritual spaces to purify and cleanse the air of any negative energies for centuries. Ah, so that's really interesting. And it probably ties into why juniper was used to purify houses during the plague outbreaks in the 15th and 16th centuries, where large bushels of it would be burnt in the houses to fumigate them. This would have actually been done whilst the family members were still inside, because they would have also needed purification. Ah, of course. See, juniper and its smoke and berries have long been believed to have purifying and healing properties, and I'm sure that as your grandpa learned the names of the trees, he also learned the uses of each tree, deepening and layering his knowledge of nature. In this way, the meaning would have been given to the language of nature, which had been passed down generation by generation to him. My granddad also always made me rope swings in the woods. Every time we went down the woods, he'd take a rope with him and just... (laughs) He'd tie a branch to one end of it, chuck it round a bigger branch. Yep. Boom. Learning about nature. Learning about nature. That's brilliant. (laughs) (laughs) 
what were your hobbies when you were a young man? I liked, well, I, I was good at ice skating. I used to like playing ice hockey, you know. I was quite good at fit. Well, I was the captain of the Fitba team when I was Thornhill. The last year I was there at the school, I was the captain of the Morton Academy. <laughs> mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. What advice would you give to children nowadays? Yeah, well, I think they've all just got to re- lead their own life, haven't they, and have a bit of sense about them. Just to stick in and learn as much as you can about... Well, no, I never met learn much at the school, but stick in once you get a job and try and learn, try and be an expert at whatever you're doing. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and make sure you...